and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Test three, section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the fifteenth. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents: vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. The documents are essential, so A has been written in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen. Because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the fifteenth. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents: vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order. I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room, personal effects, in other words. Okay. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you, pounds that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say fifty as an absolute minimum. Okay. Now the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Now, something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country, and secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage. Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. Okay, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things; they'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes. 
perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again, you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. Hmm. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark, Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? It's actually W-A-R-K, but we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage, enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <laughs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. <laughs> oh yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. <laughs> OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. Oh, you're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Listening, section 2. You will hear an extract from a radio program about a famous bridge. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 18. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 18. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is nearly three quarters of a century old and to help celebrate this important occasion, our reporter Sarah Chambers has compiled this brief history of her favourite bridge. A bridge is more than just a crossing over a river or a waterway. It is a landmark in its own right a landmark which allows us to identify one city from another. Think, for instance, of the Bridge of Sighs in Venice or the magnificent Charles Bridge in Prague. Each of these cities can be recognised by their famous bridges. 
The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is another example of a city known by its bridge. But in addition to this, a bridge is a kind of ornament for a city, similar, if you like, to a cathedral or a palace. Here in Sydney, we may not have our own palace, but we do have our famous and much loved bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is sometimes affectionately known as the Coat Hanger because of its arched shape. It was built back in the 1930s, and so the bridge is coming up for a significant birthday. Let's have a little look at its history. Although the idea of building a crossing over Sydney Harbour had been discussed many years earlier, it wasn't until the year 1916 that the state government agreed to allocate some money for the construction of a bridge. The chief engineer for the bridge was a man called Dr. John Bradfield, a brilliant engineer who supervised the entire project from beginning to end. First, they had to decide on a design, so he organized an international competition to choose a design, and ultimately got the one he wanted. The job went to a British engineering firm, and the contract was signed in 1924. The design he chose was the single arch bridge that you see today, made of steel with a tower at either end. In 1926, construction finally began. The first thing they had to do was demolish 800 houses around the site where the towers were to be built. The poor families, however, never received any compensation for this. But the project created thousands of jobs, much needed in those difficult times. Of course, like all projects of this size, it took much longer to build than originally planned. It was supposed to have been finished by 1930. But actually, it wasn't completed for another two years. It also cost twice as much as the original quote, coming in at £9.5 million instead of the agreed contract price of £4.2 million. But what's new? <laughs> the opening ceremony took place on the 19th of March, 1932, and a large crowd gathered for the occasion. The Premier of the state was just about to cut the ribbon when suddenly a man rode through the crowd mounted on a horse and slashed the ribbon with his sword. He wanted to be the first to cut the ribbon. Anyway, they tied the ribbon back together and the ceremony continued. The man on the horse was fined five pounds for his offensive behaviour. Before you hear the rest of the talk, You have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Since then, millions of cars have crossed the bridge, each paying a toll to do so. By the early 1980s, the government had paid off the loan for the money they'd borrowed all those years before. But motorists continued to pay to cross from north to south. This money was subsequently used to build a tunnel under the harbour to reduce the amount of traffic on the bridge. The tunnel was opened in 1992 and cost $544 million. It is 2.3 kilometres long and is equipped with all the latest technology, including closed circuit television to monitor any problems. And it has most definitely reduced the load on the bridge as it carries around 75,000 vehicles each day, which would otherwise have to use the bridge. And it's apparently strong enough to withstand the impact of a ship or even the impact of an earthquake. The tunnel has been a welcome solution to Sydney's traffic problems, but of course, a tunnel could never compete with a bridge as a landmark for any city. So let's wish the bridge a very happy birthday. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average. I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Mm -hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material, when you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock, it's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so... 
I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it and will just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there, and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of a talk about the design of the zip fastener. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. I think you all have a copy of the printed notes and diagram, but I should point out before we go any further that there are a few mistakes in those notes, so please correct any you notice as we go along. Right. As you can see, we are going to be looking at the zip, or zipper as it's known in the US, which is where it had its origins in 1851. In fact, it was initially given the rather less catchy name of the Automatic Continuous Clothing Closure by the person that invented it, Elias Howe, who also designed the first sewing machine. It wasn't until 1893, though, that someone actually tried to market the zip, when Whitcomb Judson, another American inventor, took what he called the clasp locker to the World's Fair held that year in the U.S. His hook-and-eye system was a commercial disaster, and it was another 15 years before the buying public began to take an interest. This time, a more reliable model with facing sets of teeth named the Hookless Fastener, designed by a Swedish engineer called Gideon Sundback. Attached to clothing, purses, and other items, it sold quite well. Gradually, this new alternative to buttons caught on. As people realized the advantages of a fastener that only needed one hand to operate, that children could use, that left no visible gaps, and so on. The British firm Kinnock began producing and selling the Ready Fastener in large numbers in 1919. And a few years later, the zipper, designed and given its modern American name by B.F. Goodrich, made Mr. Goodrich extremely rich indeed. Test 2. Listening. Section 4. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. 
If its use in trousers was a major factor in establishing the zip as a fashion icon, despite its occasional tendency to trap parts of the wearer's anatomy, another major breakthrough came with the separable zip, the kind that opens at both ends. This type, still widely used in a range of items, from jackets to tents, is shown in the diagram. Let's look first at the right-hand side of the illustration, at the material attached to the uh, item of clothing, the bag, or whatever. This is the tape, which is usually made of fairly tough fabric. At the end of that, there's what is known as the heat seal patch, the cotton and nylon laminated material used to reinforce the tape. Now, alongside the heat seal patch is a small piece of metal used only on a separating zip, whose function is to enable the two halves of the zip to join. This is known as the pin. Opposite that, on the other half of the zip in the diagram, is a device which correctly aligns the pin. The box, as it's called, begins the joining of the zip halves. Running up the inside edge of each half are dozens, possibly hundreds, of metal teeth, each of which has a small hook and an equally tiny hollow. Moving up and down the teeth to open and close the zip is a piece of metal called the slider. This is operated by means of a pull tab, so-called because, logically enough, the wearer or a user pulls it in one direction or the other. To close the zip, a wedge inside the slider pushes the hook of each tooth on one side into the hollow of each offset tooth on the other. To open it, the wedge forces them apart. To prevent the slider coming off the teeth at the other end, there is a top stop on both sides of the zip. This basic design has changed little in the many years since it was first introduced, although nowadays, of course, zips, uh, zippers, are available in a whole range of shapes, sizes, and materials. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test,